Now that we've got PHP version 5 installed, let's proceed to focusing on the command line interface. So our first step is to focus on CLI. The command line interface is an interpreter similar to Perl or Python, which allows you to execute PHP code from the shell. So permits execution of PHP code from the shell. By default, it's called PHP 5, default name. And you can symbolically link this to a name such as PHP if you'd like. Let's go to a shell and execute a which PHP 5. As you can see, it's in user bin. And it's called, again, PHP 5. So the default location is user bin. And the name of the CLI interface is PHP 5. This particular CLI interface can be called from Apache, but it's not optimal. What is optimal is to use the Apache module. That's the module that we've installed. And that particular module will, by default, process PHP scripts. So the Apache module provides a module that's loaded into memory at runtime when Apache launches, and it processes PHP version 5.4 and older scripts. But optionally, you could invoke PHP as a CGI, directly calling user bin PHP 5. But there should be no need for using PHP as a CGI unless you're using a non-standard web server that doesn't have a module for PHP. When you execute PHP 5 by default, you can specify the help option to see the different options that are available to you. Otherwise, when you execute it without the help option, PHP 5 expects standard input such as to do something in between PHP type tags. Now let's just discuss what we mean by tags. PHP tags usually resemble the following. An open less than symbol followed by a question mark and optionally a PHP followed by PHP code followed by a closed question mark and a closed greater than symbol or a greater than symbol. So generally when you define your scripts to be processed by the CLI or from the or by the web server you will specify your PHP code in between PHP type tags. You'll find this if examining existing PHP code and you'll have to specify it when defining new code. Optionally you may use short tags. These are called short tags because you simply specify a less than symbol followed by a question mark followed by your PHP code which could span many lines and could include multiple statements followed by a close syntax. Now from the shell let's go ahead and show you what modules are available to PHP. We'll kill this particular interface with a control D and if you give it no input PHP 5 returns typical content type headers that are to be returned to the client and that's a web client. So the CLI interface defaults to standard output or standard requirements for a web server processing CGI to be returned to a web client, such as a web browser, which includes the content type and an optional header. In this case, it says powered by PHP in the version. Normally, when you write CGI scripts, regardless of language, it could be per Python, Perl, Ruby, or PHP, it is required that you specify a content type line followed by two line feeds indicating that the file is properly formatted to be a CGI file. Well, the PHP 5 CLI interface takes care of that for us, so we don't need to specify it. So you can go ahead and define scripts and run them using the CGI interface and not have to specify an output of content type like you do with Perl. But that isn't important because we have modular support for PHP provided by the Apache 2 module PHP 5. We're just mentioning it just in the event that you do research regarding how to run CGI scripts from your web server. Super. So if you want to see what modules this particular CLI is aware of, simply execute PHP 5 followed by the M option. That's the option that you show, see here. This will show you modules that PHP 5 has access to. This is important because if you want to know what your, your command line interface is able to do, as well as the web server, then the M option will tell you which modules it's able to call and what it's able to do, including the ability to talk to XML, multi-byte strings, 
MySQL, which is the module that we installed, by the way, PHP 5-MySQL, provides the support necessary for the command line interface. OpenSSL, Perl compatible regular expressions, Session, which we mentioned is now included by default in PHP and isn't provided as a separate RPM package for the SUSE distro, and others, including ZLib, XML, and if you want, you can download additional modules from the website. We went to the mirrors.kernel website. But as it stands, this is what our current build of PHP version 5 is able to do, or the, the different modules it's able to call to perform functionality for us. If you'd like to see a nice pretty HTML format of the compiled modules and a lot more information, execute PHP 5 followed by the I option. But the problem with running this is it'll dump everything to the screen to stand it out. So to get useful output, send the output into a text file. We'll send it into a file. We'll call it php5 underscore info dot html. And then from the browser, we'll open this file. So let's go to the browser and go to home Linux CBT PHP 5. And once in there, we'll see the HTML5, php5 info dot html. It begins by echoing in large letters or large font the version of PHP which is 5.03 although there is a later version op available based on version 5.1 5.03 represents the RPMs that we downloaded and will suffice for our studies the system is returned this is basically a uname dump if you go to the shell and execute name uname all this is the same thing it's a uname dump which includes the version of the kernel when it was compiled and the platform. The build date, this is for PHP, it was built April 23rd, the, these RPM packages, prior to being released with SUSE 9.3 at the time. Here's the command that was used to build the RPM packages. So this tells you which modules or which particular options PHP 5 will support. And as you can see, it was pretty much compiled with almost everything, from MySQL to MySQL I, which is the improved MySQL driver, OpenSSL, SNMP, pretty much everything was turned on when the RPM package for, P for PHP 5 was compiled. So in the event that we want to provide support to some of these modules, we simply need to download the RPM package for the module, install it, and PHP will be able to access the capabilities of those modules. Server API, CGI, virtual directory support turned off, Here's the default PHP INI file that the, the command line client will read when executing scripts. And that file, by the way, is located in etc PHP 5 CLI. This particular file is read by the CLI interface every time it's invoked. And it contains key items. Let's take a brief look, including options for databases and so on. You can go through it. It tells you what the file does and it basically sets options for how to handle variables such as registering globals, language options, whether or not to support active server page style tags using less than sign, percent, percent less and greater than symbol, but the default is turned off so in the event that you have code that is based on PHP but using ASP tags and you want the command line interface to process it or even the web interface, simply update the, the appropriate INI files, the PHP INI files, read by the appropriate modules. And many options are defined, whether or not output compression is turned on or off. Keep going through this file, you'll see safe mode and different related settings that tune the way the PHP CLI or command line interface works. We can set resource limits, the amount of memory that can be used, per script. So if you notice that there are output errors running scripts either from the web context or the command line interface context, which means the shell, related to memory, you'll want to open the appropriate INI file and increase the memory. This often occurs for web applications that rely upon a slightly larger footprint for operations. So to handle file uploads, for example, for email, you may need to increase the memory limit. And those are just some examples. There's an error reporting section. And as you navigate throughout this document, you'll see data handling, how it handles data, which variables are allowed, paths and directories, 
where it can find extensions. When you install modules that are extensions, they get placed into UserLive PHP 5 extensions. You can take a brief look at this directory from a separate shell and you'll see that the modules that provide additional support are in this directory including ZLive, MySQL, OpenSSL, and MBString. Those are the packages that we install. They simply drop their drivers into the extensions directory and the command line interface client when parsing the PHP INI file knows to go and look for extensions in UserLib PHP 5 extensions. So there are many settings, even settings related to file uploads. Here's a maximum file size set. So if you notice that with one of your PHP enabled applications that rely upon MySQL or maybe not is bucking or responding negatively when handling uploaded files, perhaps there's a file size limit that is being met. The default is 2 megs, but oftentimes folks use email for larger than or web-based PHP applications for larger attachments than the default limit of 2 megabytes. So you'll need to tweak this option. You may even disable file uploads altogether, preventing file uploads. And again, many of the directives that you see in this PHP INI file apply to the web context and also apply when the PHP 5 binary is being used as a CGI or a common gateway interface. So in other words, if you're running your Apache web server but you neglect to use the Apache module and you'd rather or for whatever reason turn on CGI support calling the, the PHP 5 binary, then these directives will be read and the binary will know what limits for file sizes, whether or not it'll even accept file uploads and so on. And here are some additional extensions. How to handle mail. It uses SMTP port 25 on the local host to send mail. So if a form page submits to an action page or a backend PHP script which sends mail, the PHP 5 binary, if you're using CGI mode, will consult local host in 25 for sending mail. Then we get into the SQL section. Whether or not support for ODBC is turned on, persistent connectivity, there's MySQL support for the MySQL module. There's also MySQL improved support for the enhanced version of the MySQL driver, which supports versions 4.13 and higher. And since we're running 5.018, we'll be using the MySQL improved driver. There are drivers for MSQL, PostgreSQL, Sybase, and many other database engines. And essentially, the last section in this document deals with whether or not session support is turned on. So you'll see that there's a whole area for session handling. You can decide whether or not you want session support to be turned on. It is enabled by default and a default variable of PHP session ID is used and constructed within the context of the web server whenever sessions are created, whether cookie based or in memory sessions. So this is just a brief overview of this PHP INI file. Again, it's in etc PHP 5 CLI, and the CLI file, the CLI directory that is, contains a PHP.ini file. But the Apache 2 subdirectory contains its PHP INI file, which is independent of the CLI directory's PHP INI file, although they're similar in size, very close in size, only three bytes off. The difference is as follows. The Apache module, when executing within the context of Apache, reads the PHP INI file from the Apache 2 directory. And the PHP 5 binary, the CLI binary, reads etc PHP 5 CLI PHP INI. So they process two separate INI files, and you can treat them separately. But the flexibility is there. So perhaps we should take some notes regarding what flexibility is allowed. So CLI binary which is located in user bin PHP 5 can be configured to run as a CGI via Apache but is not recommended because there exists an Apache PHP 5 module, which means it'll execute much quicker and be more efficient. But this can occur, and CLI binary parses etc PHP 5 CLI PHP.ini 
whereas Apache module parses etc php5 apache2 php.ini. So they read two separate INI files, albeit very similar. But you need to decide which INIs to update for which context, whether it's a shell-based application versus a web-based application. PHP 5 operates in both modes. So note, PHP 5 can operate in two modes. One, CLI, which is really an acronym for Command Line Interface Mode and two, Apache module. We're saying Apache because this is the default web server, or it is the default web server within a Nix-based environment. But PHP 5 is also implemented as modules for other types of web servers. But these are the two primary modes, command line interface and Apache module. And the command line interface can double so we should say CLI can double as a CGI processor. So in other words, Apache can call the, the command line interface and it will invoke one thread per request. So if there's a page that needs to be processed, Apache will simply launch the PHP 5 binary each time. But we're not going to look at that option because a module exists as we keep mentioning. So these are some of the modes. Now let's just show you some basic ways of defining variables and echoing output to the screen before we move on to other things with PHP 5. From the shell, let's define a file which will echo basic output such as hello world. We'll use pico and we'll call it hello world. In fact, let's create this in our home directory. So we'll go to Linux CBT PHP 5 and we'll say pico hello world dot php the suffix doesn't need to be php5 it can be anything ideally it should be php so version independent but you can call it whatever you want we'll show you momentarily that you can use a shebang header similar to other scripting languages to have the file execute the proper interpreter but again to specify that PHP is to process the contents of a file, we should begin the file with open PHP tags and close the file with closing PHP tags and in between place our logic. So let's go ahead and echo hello world and we'll terminate with a new line character so that PHP prints a new line character, otherwise it will not. For each statement, simply terminate the statement, statement with a semicolon, similar to the way statements are terminated within MySQL. So you specify a function that's required by, or that is recognized, that is, by PHP, followed by the arguments that are accepted. In this case, the arguments are between double quotes, followed by a semicolon. Anything between opening and closing tags will be processed, and we can specify multiple statements. Let's go ahead and save this document and from a separate shell we'll navigate into PHP 5 and providing we're able to read the document we should be able to process it so we'll simply execute PHP 5 followed by hello world. Now if you want to parse this file to ensure that the syntax is correct there is an option which will allow you to check the syntax before you run it. Let's go ahead and do that. It will be a PHP 5-i followed by the name of the document. This will process it and if there are any problems it will return the syntax errors. In this case we specified i, it's php l to check the syntax. i dumps the actual info. And as you can see here no syntax errors detected in the name of the script. So php-l will check your syntax. No need to memorize it of course because you can always check the help. But in this case note syntax check use php l lowercase l and if there are any errors php will return as such we could go ahead and create an error condition let's remove the opening tag save the file with control o then return to the second shell and rerun php l and it still returns those syntax errors it's able to parse the file with no problems because the statements look clean let's go ahead and remove closing tags as well 
and rerun PHP L. Still no syntax errors. So let's execute PHP 5 against hello world.php. And notice what it does is it prints exactly what's in the file rather than interpreting the file. So when you don't have opening and closing tags, the file the file's contents will not be interpreted correctly. They'll be simply echoed to the screen as if you had used the cat command. So let's take a brief look at that again. We'll rerun it. And now the contents have been interpreted and printed to the screen, plus the silent new line character. Had we not specified the new line character, you'll see that hello world will, would be printed right before the prompt with no new line. Notice hello world printed and then the Linux prompt was pr printed on the same line. That's why we specify a new line character. And you're also able to specify as many new line characters as you'd like or as is appropriate for your application. And PHP will accommodate your request by simply echoing n number of new line characters. That's a simple hello world. How about setting variables, for example? So you can print definitely a string explicitly. That's the easiest thing to do. To set a variable, simply define the variable using a dollar sign. And in this case, we'll call the variable message. We'll set message equal to either between single or double quotes. Usually you use double quotes when you want variable interpolation to work and single quotes where you want things to be treated literally. So the message in this case will be hello world followed by a new line character. And then we'll substitute hello world in the echo section to simply be echo message. And message will be interpol interpolated, thus the message variable that is, will be interpolated appropriately. Let's save the changes. Return to the shell, clear screen, and re-execute the file. Notice it still prints hello world, and we've defined correctly the variable. As mentioned, we could use single or double quotes. Either or will work. So go ahead and update your quotes to single if you don't want variable interpolation to be performed. Return to the shell, rerun, and you'll see it still prints, but guess what? It prints literally. The backslash n was actually returned to the shell. So ver variable interpolation is important if you want items to be interpolated such as backslash n, non-printing characters, or even other variables. For example, you could set one variable to the value of another variable, or you can concatenate variables, and those would require double quotes. But you can mix and match double and single quotes depending on whether or not you want interpolation to work. Notice also that the default for PHP 5 is to print, as we've mentioned, standard CGI headers which includes a content type line followed by two backslash ends or non-printing new line characters and optionally additional headers. You can suppress the headers by including the Q option. PHP 5-Q followed by the name of the script will simply process and echo to the screen the message and refrain from echoing standard CGI headers. So if you want to see just the works of the script and not standard headers, use the Q option. That will suppress the HTML. Now, of course, we're taking a brief look at some of the capabilities of PHP because the intent is to focus on PHP integration with MySQL. If you want an in-depth look at PHP, then look at Linux CBT PHP edition. So we're just going to breeze through some of this stuff with the expectation that you understand scripting languages and just want to dig right in. Let's look at some more basics. PHP maintains a plethora of server and in-memory type variables, of which a type is actually called underscore server. From this PHP info page, if we take a brief look, this page of course is generated by using the I option. If we take a brief look at the server variable at section by scrolling down, we'll see it momentarily. You also see the modules that are supported, including libxml, mysql, mysql info, or improved that is, OpenSSL, Perl compatible regular expressions, sessions, and so forth. But you will see momentarily some of the, ver the variables that are supported, including here are environmental variables that pertain to the currently logged in user. These are my variables. And here are PHP variables. These are variables that are maintained in memory. One of the types of variables is called underscore server, and there are many of these types of variables. We can output information from the underscore server server-side variables as well. 
And for example, let's echo to the screen the user variable. So we'll find underscore server bracket user. We can dump this particular variable to the screen in our hello world script as a simple example. And we'll just go ahead and paste it to a separate line. Otherwise, if we were to place this particular variable next to our message variable, we would have to perform concatenation, which is supported. It's just easier if we do it this way. So we could echo hello world or hello with a space with no new line character, followed by the user, Linux CBT, instead of Dean, and then follow up with a new line character by echoing a separate line, just to show you that multiple statements are supported. So we could simply echo new line character at the end and this would effectively print two messages on the same line followed by a new character again this could all be concatenated quite simply let's go ahead and try to run that and debug and notice it printed hello space linux cbt taking the variable directly from the server which is exactly what we wanted so there are variables and categories or classes of variables that can be accessed such as server environmental variables cookie type variables, session variables, and many other types of variables that can be derived by the PHP 5 command line interface binary. But again, setting variables is very simple. Dollar sign the name of the variable, set it to something in between double or single quotes depending on whether or not you want interpolation to be performed, and then you can echo it or print it, but echo is a common command used to dump the contents of a variable to the output location, whether it be screen, file, or whatever, or back to the web client via the web server. When defining your PHP scripts, use short or long tags. You can optionally, as mentioned, use PHP as a different version on a tag and it will still work. And just include your PHP code in between using the CLI interface. For any function that's supported by the CLI interface, you can integrate it into your script. Test the syntax, of course, using the L option. You may also suppress HTML headers by using the Q option. Otherwise, PHP will parse, execute, but prefix whatever it's parsed and executed with the standard CGI headers, which includes the content type. So the CLI interface is available, it's powerful, it's similar to Perl, not as powerful as Perl, but similar to Perl, and can access the wealth of functions provided by PHP, including, again, MySQL, LibXML, and anything that PHP can pretty much be do through the web browser via the web server, you can do from the command line interface. Next, we're going to look at integrating PHP 5 into or with MySQL via the web server and web browser. Now let's take a look at how MySQL can be integrated with PHP by writing the proper code necessary for connecting to the backend DBMS. Basically, connectivity to a MySQL server entails four steps. So let's take some notes regarding those steps and then we'll begin constructing our connection statements. So MySQL PHP connectivity. And by the way, this applies to both PHP scripts from the shell using the CLI interpreter that we've used thus far as well as PHP running as an Apache module processing requests from the web client or from a web form for example so in other words brokering a request on behalf of variables submitted by a client such as first name last name etc so the connectivity entails four steps so note it entails basically four steps and this is the case with the current MySQL improved interface as well as the existing MySQL interface which supports the older version of the, the DBMS MySQL so it entails basically four steps those steps are as follows one is to define a connection object the second step is to define a query that we'd like to execute against the DBMS server or have the DBMS server execute for us. The third step is to actually execute the query. 
and after the query has been executed and the results have been returned to PHP's memory space, the fourth step is to output the results of the query. And optionally, we could perform other steps such as executing methods of the MySQLi connection API, such as returning a number of rows affected, as well as if there were any warnings, the record counts that were returned, and so on. So the four-step process for setting up connectivity to your MySQL backend server includes the following. Defining the connection object, that's step one. You must set up a connection object, and we'll be using the object-oriented version of MySQL I for setting up the object to the database. There are two styles that are supported, both object-oriented as well as procedural. We'll be using object-oriented. So we'll define it first, define the query. A simple query would suffice, such as selecting a few or distinct column names from a given table, or even as complex as performing multiple joins. Once the query has been prepared, you then execute it, and once executed, PHP submits the query to the MySQL server and a result set is returned, which is then stored within the memory space of PHP. But then it's our job as a programmer of PHP to output the results using one of the many facilities that PHP supports for gaining access to the two-dimensional data that's returned by DBMS. DBMS's rows and columns. Now there's no need to memorize all the syntax necessary for covering the four steps mentioned. Simply navigate to the following website and keep it as a reference because you'll use it time and time again for setting up connections and for referencing various functions supported by PHP. We'll navigate to php.net forward slash manual forward slash English if you want a different version then select a different language just stop at the manual page and then select English and we'll just go directly to English which is the default directory and since we know the function that we're interested in we'll go directly to it by the way this particular page the manual page shows or it contains consists of the entire manual including all the functions supported including MySQL if you search this page for MySQL you'll see that the MySQL functions are located here but we want to use the MySQL improved extension because it supports higher versions of MySQL versions 4.13 and higher MySQL the basic library will work but it isn't suggested in fact if you read through the documentation it says that it's preferred that if you that you use MySQL I when interacting with 4.1 or higher DBMSs. So we're just going to go ahead and click on MySQL I, and this will take us to the home page for the manual for the functions or for this particular function and its various features. So the MySQL I or improved extension home page will will be bookmarked because we'll reference it time and time again. And once there, you'll see all of the various functions that are supported by MySQL I. Simply scroll down towards the bottom and you'll see a list right above the blog area or the response area and here's the table of contents. These are all the different methods that can be invoked such as affected rows, turning on auto commit, closing a connection, actually creating a connection or establishing the connection object which is step one of four and so on, fetching rows, storing them in arrays, etc. So let's minimize this browser instance and begin defining a simple query. The simplest way to represent your query in PHP is to first ensure that it works locally on the system and then just copy and paste. So we'll connect as root to the local instance and we'll show databases followed by a use of our most frequently used database. Let's take a look at HR. Let's use HR followed by show tables. And we'll, this one only has test in ODB, so let's use HR4. That probably has what we want, followed by show tables. And this one doesn't, so let's use HR3, followed by again show tables. And this one does. So we'll select star from employees. And you'll see that employees contains four columns, ID, first name, last name, and pay scale ID. So this is the most recent instance. We're going to go ahead and execute a PHP query based simply on F name and L name. 
So we basically want via the PHP code to execute execute a query which resembles select f name comma l name from employees. This is going to be our query. We'll just take it and paste it into our text file so that when we get to the section where we actually prepare the query we can just wrap the PHP code around it. So this is our query. But we've yet to define the actual connection object which is step one. So step one tells us to define the connection object. The way you define a connection object is as follows. You assign the connection object's details to a variable. So we'll go ahead and create a variable and call it con1. And again, the way you define variables within PHP is to simply use the dollar sign, followed by the name of the variable, and then you set it equal to something, whether it's a function, calls to functions, routines, or a static. So it can be a constant or a static or a changing value provided by a function, that is. Now we're going to create a new instance of the MySQLi library by typing in new followed by MySQLi. This creates a new object instance of the MySQLi API, which allows us to connect to the MySQL DBMS. This is the improved driver. And in between parentheses, we'll specify all of the key values, including hostname, and we'll substitute all of this momentarily username, password, and the default database. These are the four values that are accepted by a connection object that's instantiated within PHP when attempting to connect to MySQL using the improved API. It accepts hostname, username, password, and default DB. So this constitutes, these four pieces of information constitute a connection object which will be in memory for the duration of the PHP script whether it be a script run from the CLI from the shell or via the web server via the Apache module or even via the CGI invocation. No matter how you call PHP the assignment of the object MySQLi and its four parameters into a variable called con1 will set up an array which will persist in memory for the duration of the page. So having said that, let's go ahead and define our official connection object. We'll again call it con1. We'll set it equal to a new instance of MySQLi followed by the host name which is localhost. And by the way, you can include these values in quotes, especially if there are spaces or characters that need to be escaped properly. The username, as you know, is root. We certainly could grant a new user privileges, but we'll just go with root followed by ABC123 and a default DB of HR3. So this sets the context. No differently than connecting from the shell using MySQL, just like we've done. Let's quit and show you that again. So from the shell, we simply MySQL user root password ABC123 and the default database HR3. This is essentially what the PHP programming environment will set up or submit to the server for us. It'll create a connection string based on what we've just performed from the shell. So it's very similar. So this is our connection object. And this con connection object is an array that's stored in memory that's reusable for the duration of the script. And it also includes included scripts. So for the duration of our little hello world script, as long as we have the script in memory or it persists in memory, you can include additional scripts and they can make use of the connection pool that's created once this object is in memory. And this object's name again is con1. So we've gotten step one out of the way. Step two is to define the query. So let's just indent this so it's clear and step two says to define the query. The query is defined similarly which is to set up a variable and we'll call that variable query one and set it equal to the actual contents of the query in between double quotes. We'll define the query in between double quotes but we don't need to terminate with a semicolon. So let's go ahead and select f name comma l name from employees. That's the query, but notice no semicolon. It's not required because the PHP MySQL improved API handles the termination of the SQL statements that are submitted to the server on our behalf. So it's performed 
by PHP for us and we don't need to do it. So step two, we've defined the query. Step three is to actually execute the query. And there are myriad ways to execute the query, such as simply resulting the, or sending the results to a new variable, which you'll generally see in a documentation as result. But we're going to go ahead and call ours result one. So generally in, in the PHP documentation, you'll see something such as the following result equals followed by the connection objects variable con1 followed by a pointer which uses a dash and a greater than symbol to reference the object followed by the method query and then the name of the query which we've defined as query1 if you're unfamiliar with object oriented programming this can seem a little daunting but it's very straightforward all this really says to PHP is assigned to a newly constructed variable we're gonna call it result1 so that we can tie all of our queries together. So assign to a variable called result1 using the connection object that's already in memory, so using all of the parameters defined in the connection object, including the host to connect to, the user, the password, and the default database, the method query. And the method query will accept another variable which has a predefined query. So we're just nesting here. So result one, when it's all said and done, will rely upon connection object one or con one to go out and perform its method query based on query one, which is equivalent to what you see between the two quotes here. So again, it's nesting. And once result one has been executed, providing there are no errors, the PHP page that has executed the query will construct in memory an array which contains the results of each row and we'll then be able to move on to step four which is to output the results of each row in the table structure again the table structure is two-dimensional so for each row we'll just have n number of columns represented by a PHP array and we can use while and for each type loops within PHP to simply iterate through each of the records that are returned so step four as mentioned there are myriad ways to perform step three as well as step four as well as step two, we can wrap each of these steps into conditions, for example, to test whether or not they've been performed successfully. But we're just going to go ahead and show you a real easy way to output the results using one of the neat functions provided by MySQLi. That particular function will allow us to fetch the names of the columns directly, and it's actually called fetch object. So we're going to use a while loop let's go ahead and specify while while will be our iterator it'll iterate through all of the results until it ends and we're going to define an object so while or a new variable which will store the results in an object so we'll say while object or obj one is equal to result so now we're taking the result set so result one so while it's equal to result one will then invoke the method fetch underscore object and what this will do is it'll represent each of the columns by its actual column name the way the query was executed so this looks a little complicated but it really isn't we're running a while loop we're making use of the fetch object method which will actually map variables that we can use that match the names of the columns that were selected including first name or f name and l name so in the body of this while loop, all we'll do here is simply print out the output using printf, which formats the print. And since our values are string base, we'll specify percent %s to format it as a string, followed by percent %s for, for last name, followed by a new line character, followed by the actual object method, which is, or the variable storing the object, which is called obj1, followed by the name of each of the variables including or each of the columns selected including f name followed by obj1 l name again there are much easier ways to output your result set in PHP don't let this seem too daunting but this is just a convenient way of accessing the column names as they were selected in your query in step two this is just a really easy way of doing it otherwise you'd, you'd have to use one of the other functions such as fetch array and then make references to the array using a generic name followed by the position in which you select the column such as position zero for f name position one for l name 
two for the next column, three for the subsequent column, and so on, incrementing by one each step of the way. So what we have here seems like a lot, but again, it's not. Now again, there's a lot of error checking that we can wrap around this to check to ensure that our connection has worked and we don't end up wasting server resources as a result if there are bro broken connections. And we're going to wrap that in right now. So let's just copy and paste over each of the steps and we'll comment it in our script. We're going to use the same hello world script. We'll just extend it and we're going to label this section using C style comments DBMS connectivity test and we'll call this particular s section step one create connection object and then we'll close the comments and then paste in our connection object. So there's a connection object. That's taken care of. Now you may be wondering, is this a safe way to represent your connection object since passwords and usernames or credential sets are stored in the clear? Which is why you'll find with many PHP applications, there's usually an include of the configuration file. So the configuration file tends to be buried in a directory beneath the main application with restricted permissions. So that's another way you could do it. You could store the DBMS connectivity related portions, at least a sensitive portion, such as the username and password or the creation of the connection object in a file and then use the file system's permissions to heavily restrict access to the file. So that's step one. Now step two, as mentioned, we need to define the query. So step two is to define the query to be executed by the MySQL server. So let's go ahead and get our syntax for step two. And we've just created, as you'll find with pretty much all my MySQL PHP type documentation out there, we've created a basic variable called query1. Most documentation just simply refer to con and query. But we're calling them con1 and query1 purposely because in the event that you want to define a PHP script which opens multiple connections to different DBMS servers, you certainly can. If you do intend to do work in a different database within the same connection, so on the same host, for example, then there's no need to create a new connection string. You can just simply use the MySQLI select DB function, which will allow you to select or change the database, which is one of the methods. But if you do intend to have one page consult multiple databases, then it's a good idea to label your variables logically, such as, or to group them logically, such as con1, query1, result1 followed by con2, query2, result2. So there's our query, select fname, last name, or fname, lname from employees. And this will, once executed, go and grab those two columns and store them in separate elements in an array within PHP. Let's move on to step three. So step three is to actually execute the defined query and we have our syntax ready to go and the execution is quite straightforward it's essentially to define a new variable call the connection object with the query method followed by the query variable which will expose what we we define in the query one variable so this is how you actually invoke the query on the server and as you know step four is to output the results now we've yet to wrap any error checking around any of our code here so if the connection breaks the rest of the page will continue to process for example if the connection object is not created step two will still be set up in memory step three will attempt to run and step four will run but first we'll show you that things work when things do work and then in the next section we'll focus on wrapping error handling around each of the steps so that we're able to back out gracefully all right, so now step four, we're making use of this fetch object method. As mentioned, it's only one way. Let's search this page, fetch underscore object. So it's merely one way of myriad ways to retrieve results from a result set. It fetches a result row as an object, and it names each value with the name of the column as you selected them. Notice there are also other methods, such as fetching the fields, if you wanted a list of fields within a table structure fetch a, spe a specific field 
or just fetch the results into an array and then leave it up to you to programmatically expose each of the columns using the array elements. So let's return to our script here. Again, this is going to be executed from the command line, but it doesn't matter because PHP has connectivity to the DBMS using MySQL's improved interface, which we installed. And we can confirm that, of course, from the shell by executing. Let's open a new shell, PHP 5. M, this will return the modules and you'll see that the MySQL I interface if it is installed will be revealed here you don't see you see MySQL so we're gonna go ahead and install MySQL I before we invoke this particular PHP script otherwise it'll return an error now let's check to see if we've actually downloaded that particular module as you can see here MB string doesn't appear that we've gotten MySQL I so what we should do before we move on to executing the script is to download that particular module. We want to navigate to the mirror site into 9.3 and we should be able to get from 9.3 SUSE i586 the MySQL package. This page takes a little bit to load and then let's go ahead and look for PHP 5 dash MySQL and here it is MySQL i package. This is the improved module. This will need to be installed before we're able to invoke it. Let's save it to our home directory and we'll su in and install it. Let's go ahead and execute an RPM UVH MySQL I and this will install it mo momentarily. And then we'll rerun PHP 5 with the M option to ensure that MySQL I shows up and it does. So that's one oversight, but you must have it installed. Otherwise, this will all throw an error. You could strip the eyes off of each of the references to MySQL, which primarily surfaces in the connection object or step one, and most of this syntax would work for the standard MySQL library, but the idea is that the standard library doesn't provide full support for 4.1 and higher. So since we're running, of MySQL that is, so since we're running MySQL 5, we're using MySQL I. So let's go through this again. We have a connection object, we have a query, we have a result set, and then we have a while loop which will use fetch object each step of the way to return the results for F name as well as L name. And we're just using a printf here to format the print for the two string values that'll be returned. F name first, last name second. And we could prefix this with our own constant such as first name or anything we want. That would certainly work. But again, these four steps assume that connectivity is good and all is well with respect to Apache invoking the PHP module which then invokes the MySQL I module which then attempts to connect to the local hosts SQL. If all is well, then fine, go ahead and run it but we'll wrap the error handling around in the subsequent section. So now it's our job to try and run this particular query. So here it is, hello world.php. We'll execute PHP again against it and begin debugging. Now let's turn on the quiet option so we suppress any HTML. And notice we have not had to do any debugging because the MySQL server is up and running and it's returned everything. So first it performed the first section of the hello world script which simply echoes hello and the user's name so hello Linux CBT followed by the users who are defined in the database now we can confirm this information from the MySQL terminal monitor interface here are the three users and we can see from the shell that the same three users were returned so so far so good now what if we were to stop the server using an RC MySQL stop and then attempt to run the PHP script certainly it would bomb and exit ungracefully and this is not the sort of thing you'd want to show to end users so let's go ahead and try to run that now this is a nasty error that you wouldn't really want a user to interpret let's go ahead and restart MySQL and again if all is well in the world of PHP to MySQL with respect to connectivity and uptime and availability and so forth then the script will run and once it runs you have your data set and again we've accessed our data set using the fetch underscore object result set iterator in conjunction with the while loop there are many other ways to get access to this information super so that's a little bit about connecting using PHP again this works regardless of whether it's the shell or the web-based version running through the module. 
Now next what we're going to do is wrap some error handling around what we've just done so that in the event that there are connectivity problems we're able to exit this particular script gracefully without bombing or blowing up on the user which certainly is not ideal. So just to recap, let's look at our notes. MySQL PHP connectivity is pretty straightforward but there are many options, there are many ways of connecting. The bottom line is there are four steps regardless of whether you're using the MySQL I, the improved, the enhanced API or the normal MySQL API. But since you're going to be focusing on MySQL version 5.x in your environment, you'll want to use MySQL I because it provides full functionality. So the first step is to find that connection object. You do so by creating a new instance of the MySQL I library. This particular library accepts four or this particular function accepts which is which is really represented by a set of by a library so each function is really a library so it accepts four parameters beginning with host name followed by username followed by password and then the default database once the connection is defined there's an array that's in memory that PHP maintains and that connection can be used by any other section of the script once the connection is defined step two is to define the query and in defining the query you specify the query without any semicolon because PHP will handle submitting the, the statement terminator for us so you simply specify your query without the typical terminator that you'd specify in the MySQL terminal monitor once you've defined your query and again this is a very simple query you could define as complex a query as MySQL will support as long as there are no string interpolation issues, MySQL will process it, providing PHP doesn't strip or damage the characters that are submitted. So providing this is all preserved, submit it as complex as you want. Step three is the actual query execution. This occurs by calling the connection object, which then invokes the query method, which accepts a variable called query one in this case. You could actually write the query in here in between single quotes. That would work as well, but it's not as neat. Step four, well by this point PHP would have used perhaps a great deal of memory or a little bit of memory depending on the requirements or the amount of rows returned, but PHP would have created in memory an array structure large enough to store the data set returned from the server. So it could be two rows or it could be two million rows. PHP will go ahead and reserve that space in memory to store the result set. So be careful that you don't return two large res result sets in your PHP scripts. You should limit them even if you do have the hardware resources. And once a result set is in memory by way of this result one variable which happens to be an array it's our job to find one of the PHP functions that will allow us to access each of the rows that are represented by these arrays and in this case we made use of the fetch underscore object function which will allow us to represent each particular column as they were selected by their names, which also means that if you use aliases in your select statement, the object or the fetch underscore object function will allow you to access the column using that alias name. For example, if we select F name as F name or let's say first, for example, just simply first, we now would need to reference in the fetch object section when outputting it as first. This is how it would work. So in our shell we'd have to update the script accordingly and then you'd see that it would work. But that's a little bit about using first or fetch object that is as our first means of querying the server. There are many other methods that we can use which we'll be looking at. But next what we want to do is show you how to error handle in your pages because although we're looking just at the shell means of connecting which is the CLI means of connecting it's the same thing with web programming. Once you can do it from the shell you can then move on to accepting variables from form fields that come from HTML forms. So next we focus on error handling then we move on to accepting variables from forms.
Now that we've successfully executed our query from the CLI interface, we want to show you a basic way of implementing error handling, which will catch errors and respond appropriately or gracefully, rather than dumping a nasty error message to the screen. As it stands, our current query simply executes, and if there is an error, such as the server being unavailable for whatever reason, it dumps a nasty error message potentially to the user's web browser or to the screen. But we can put error handling logic into our connections, which will enable us to avoid nasty errors being retor returned to the user, or at least being able to catch those errors and rendering a more sensible error to the user. Let's show you how you do that. We're going to go ahead and use conditional logic using the conditional if construct. What we'll do is basically wrap the queries that we execute within an if block which will return true or false and in the event that the value is false will gracefully exit rather than throwing that nasty error that we keep mentioning. So let's look at our connection steps again. The first step is to define a connection object which is not a problem and in fact this can be wrapped in an if block as well but we're just going to go ahead and return an error if the connection fails. So immediately after creating the connection block we will create an if statement which looks like the following. If statements are contained between open and close parentheses signs immediately following is an open curly brace followed by a closed curly brace and anything specified in between the curly braces will be executed if the if block matches true or if we specify a negated test then if the test happens to result in false then what's between the curly braces will be executed so based on the test performed between the parentheses if will determine whether or not to execute the block or blocks of code between the curly braces. So a simple test will allow us to check whether or not the connection was established and that logic looks like the following. We'll execute an if mysql i connect underscore err no open and close parentheses. To briefly explain what this does, in the event that there is an error connecting to the mysql server, this will return that the connection failed. So this particular function, connection error number or connect error number, is reserved for failed connections and can be negated to test for the opposite, such as if no error, for example, perform what's in between the blocks. But generally you'll state, if there is an error, perform what is stated between the blocks, such as the following. We'll print f, and we'll simply say connection to MySQL was unsuccessful followed by a percent %s for the string placeholder and a new line character. That'll suffice. Followed by a comma and the name of the function that'll return the error into the string placeholder, which is called mysqli, connect underscore error, open and close parentheses. We'll then close the parentheses for the print statement, and then close with a semicolon. So let's recap what we've got here. It's not really complicated. Immediately after a connection is established, it will return true or false for whether or not the connection was successfully established. If false, then the immediate check or test that's performed subsequent to the establishment or the attempt to establish the connection will return an error. And if this pans out to be false, it returns true for the if condition, which will print f connection to MySQL was unsuccessful with a percent %s string placeholder for the actual error returned by the server. And we will show you how this results by purposely stopping the server or what is resulting or what results on the screen when the connection fails. Immediately after printing that there was an error, it's ideal that we exit or or cease or halt processing of the script to refrain from processing other statements such as the definition of the query including the execution of the query and the return of the result set to the PHP script to be used. So in other words, rather than waste unnecessary resources, simply conserve resources by halting the script dead in its tracks if the connection fails because all else at least for the remainder of our simple script, relies upon the connection to the DBMS. 
So if we do return an error, then we'll simply exit. You can run exit just like the following, ex exit colon, or exit open and close parentheses with no values, or exit and a specific value. For example, let's say you've tagged all DBMS connection errors to be code 30, then we could exit 30, which could be further interpreted by somewhere else or some other script or some other process. So if there is an error, exit. Otherwise, we'll continue processing. And the next step in the process we'll do is to simply print the connection information. So let's print f MySQL server information percent s again as a placeholder followed by a new line character followed by MySQL i which is the driver that we're using followed by one of its methods called host underscore info which will print some useful information to the screen for us indicating that we've successfully connected. So let's take this block and copy and paste it into our script and cause the server to return an error by stopping it. We'll modify the script and where we do establish a connection immediately following in step one we'll just control shift V and if there is an error, a connection error then what will be returned is the connection was unsuccessful with whatever error MySQL returned to the PHP calling script and the remainder of the script will cease processing but in the event that the connection is successful MySQL server information will be printed to the screen. Now again you don't need to memorize this information simply navigate to the MySQL or to the PHP website that is in this case and just research the supported functions that can be located at or this particular page can be located at php.net forward slash manual forward slash your language and this happens to be called ref.mysqli.php and you'll see a list of supporting methods below. Simply scroll down and look for the MySQL connect error which we'll see momentarily and here's the error number that we're looking for and it's the MySQL connect MySQL I that is connect error number returns the error code from the last connect call. Well an error code generally is false or true and our codes testing for false or true the if block that is, is tr testing for false or true so let's go ahead and save the hello world.php and from a separate shell since we're not complete with this particular script we'll navigate into php5 we'll lsltr star.php and we will then execute php5 against hello world.php and notice it threw an error undefined variable on line 18 let's cover what that line 18 is we'll take a brief look to see what exactly it's complaining about and let's just confirm that our syntax is correct as usual we'll do a little debugging and so far so good if my SQL I connect error number printf followed by connection was unsuccessful my SQLI connect we've terminated with the quote this looks great and we exit in the event that there is an error otherwise we continue processing so this looks fine let's attempt to execute as the user root by suing in and we'll try that again and by looking a little bit deeper at this error it looks a little bit clearer it seems as if we're trying to invoke a non-existing connection object let's just review that and as you can see here we've referenced MySQLI when it should be con1 which is the name of the connection if it is successful and it was successful so let's retry that again we'll update the script this actually should be con1 and we'll save it and then rerun it so we actually don't need to be root but we'll, since we're logged in as root we'll run it anyway notice it ran successfully and here's the MySQL server information. We're connected to localhost via a Unix socket, the standard MySQL socket located in the var live MySQL directory is where we're connected to the MySQL.soc file. So by running the script, you can see that we're connected using a socket. So we've wrapped a little bit of error checking, albeit with some errors ourselves around the connection object. If indeed there was a failure, this would not work. Let's go ahead and cause a failure to occur by executing an RC MySQL stop. This will stop the MySQL server. 
and then we'll clear screen and rerun the script causing it to fail. Notice this time PHP throws an error, can't connect to local MySQL server through the socket, so it throws that error and it prints the first section hello Linux CBT because this is prior to the database logic checking that we perform but it throws an error anyway like it should and again we could further suppress the error what we're returning here is the actual error we could have returned the error number similar to what we checked for us for example here's the error that we are here's what the test the if test performance check on mysql i underscore connect underscore error and o for example rather than what we just outputted which actually shows you the exact error so let's save this return to the shell and rerun it with mysql not running and it still returns that it can't connect which as you can see here this is incorrect so let's just fix this to be errno and rerun it again we specify the wrong function super and it returns the error number instead of the long error so we have the function wrapped around the connection object now how about we move forward and wrap it around additional portions including the result set we could also run it around other sections as well so another neat place or ideal place to put error checking would be exactly where we output the result set so for example when we invoke this query we simply would wrap if an if condition which says if result pans out or hash or returns positive then output the results so we execute something such as the following if followed by another parentheses followed by open braces and then the remainder of the while loop so let's go to the shell and show you how this would work so where we execute the query and until we finish outputting the results we want to wrap an if statement by doing the following if bring result one up here if result one which is equal to the connection object itself and another parentheses and then open the curly braces to begin the entire if block will then indent the remainder of the columns here so that it's shown as a subset of the if block or nested within the if block and now we're checking based on the result set and what this will do is only output the results in the event that the result or the connection object was successful which is important and after the while loop has finished outputting its results we could then close the connection to the database server by executing the following a result which is the name of the executed query result one object call to the close method will close the connection so the logic is very simple simply wrap the execution of the query in between a condition check this condition check checks to see whether or not the connection object returns true or false if it's true it will output all of the values using the while loop and of course the fetch object method if it's false then it simply fails so if it fails we could include an else and exit with whatever error was returned or simply just exiting with a generic message saying no result or error returning results let's save the changes return to the shell now of course if we run it with the DB up and running it returns an error and connection to MySQL was unsuccessful it stops or exits the script earlier on in the process rather than going as far as we currently are however let's RC MySQL start this will create a good scenario then rerun the script and you'll see everything runs nicely the connection information is returned and because there is a result set it returned as well but there may be cases where the connection was created to a given database but the query doesn't execute it's very easy to consider such a case for example let's say we have successfully created a connection and even successfully de defaulted to the HR3 database but because the table employees does not exist the executed query returns an error for example that would cause an error in the query and it would fail to execute causing us to bypass it or handle it gracefully now right now we're not echoing anything useful but we could simply say else and extend this particular block to make it read for example 
else echo error accessing result set or something very simple from a given table number or even use one of the built-in functions to return a specific error. But the bottom line is we can trap errors both at the execution state for the query as well as the connection object state which is key when writing web applications that connect to DBMSs frequently. So again the intent is to trap errors and to treat them how you'd like to treat them or handle them the way you'd like to handle them via some sort of alternate logic. Otherwise, all of the statements within a script are processed sequentially, and if one line fails, it won't prevent the next line from running, which may be dependent on the prior line. So we've just covered some basic error handling that you can employ in your PHP based scripts that connect to MySQL servers. Simply wrap your logic in an if statement which causes the if block or if statement to check whether or not the performed test returns true or false and then rely upon the if block to determine whether or not the remainder of the script should process. That's really all you need and of course in between the if statements you can add more complex logic to handle your error situations gracefully, such as perhaps invoking an email or logging to a log file or ceasing processing or routing the user to a different script or whatever you want. But the bottom line is you want to trap key functions in if blocks and if blocks will determine whether or not that particular section was successful. Now there's some other neat things you can do with PHP based scripts when they connect to MySQL databases. For example, Let's say you want the number of rows returned by a result set. So let's just label this section useful PHP MySQL functions. And we'll just talk about two of them. One, in, one is the row count or number of rows. So it'll be connection object, connection one, for example, num underscore rows, and the other so we'll label this as number of rows returned and you invoke it by specifying the name of the connection object followed by num underscore rows and the other is the affected rows usually outputted when or return when you perform an insert or update type DML query against a database so the second type is affected rows and we access affected rows by, of course, invoking the connection object. In our case, it's called con1, followed by simply affected underscore rows. Sometimes, for the sake of invoking other scripts or performing logic that's defined in your script, you may want to base your decision on the number of rows returned or even the number of affected rows, perhaps after you've performed an update statement or a simple select statement in the prior example. These two methods are available. We're not going to focus too much time on these two methods before moving on to other things, but we want to show you how these work. Now in the prior example, we simply selected first name and last name from the employees table. If you recall, it returned those results to the shell for these particular employees, three employees. What if we weren't interested in the actual result set, but rather simply the number of rows returned when the select statement ran? Similar to a count, for example, a count based on our criteria. Well, what you'd want to do in your script is simply include what we just mentioned, the con object followed by the number of rows. Instead of closing the connection here, after the while loop has returned all of the results for first name and last name columns, we'll simply output using the print statement, of course. So we'll use a printf to format the print total records returned, followed by percent %d because the value that's returned will be of type digit. followed by the name of the result set variable which in our case is called result1 and after we've specified the result set, now this is important because for one connection object we can define multiple 
executed results. So we can use the same con1, but execute, let's say, 10 different queries. And each query is likely to return a different number of records. But since they're unrelated, we need to be specific in specifying the actual result set, result1. So this will be result1 dash number of rows, and the dash is the object-oriented notation for specifying the particular method, and it's called num underscore rows, and this is an easy way to output this information. We could assign dollar sign result1 dash greater than sign num underscore rows to a variable, and then use the variable. That would work as well if it makes your code cleaner. Let's save it and return to the shell and barring no errors we should be able to run this and get the return records as you can see total records return three first employee second and third again it may be useful for you to simply perform the query but not output any of the values that you've selected which then of course would beg the question why didn't we simply run a select count in the first place which could have been query two which certainly works as well so that's something else for example you may have both queries run and a separate query performs the count but then that's a double hit so it isn't necessary what works well in this case is that for the result set we get the right number of records returned additionally affected rows is available now before we go on to affected rows we did mention that we could in this case we specify the connection object that should be the result object result one we could assign it to a separate variable again if it makes your code more legible. Let's go to the shell and show you how you do it. Very simply, rather than including the name of the connection result object followed by the object oriented notation followed by the method num underscore rows in your printf statement or anywhere else that may look a bit messy or become hard to read, simply assign a new variable. You can call it something such as record count which is common and set it equivalent to the value of result set one object oriented notation followed by num underscore rows and then make reference below or anywhere else to record count instead and that will work as well let's go ahead and show you that we'll save the changes to the script rerun it and there you get the same value total records return and again we don't even have to prefix it isn't a requirement to prefix record count with total records returned or any text or even use printf we could simply echo the value of the variable that certainly would work as well or we could make use of it elsewhere for calculatory reasons such as performing other logic based on n number of records found in a record set so that's the total number of rows always important to know the number of rows because so many decisions are based on number of rows in a given query we did mention there's also an affected rows similar method that can be invoked once you have a result set as well. Let's go ahead and try to set up that as well before the connections close. If you do it after, of course it won't work. So we'll go ahead and create a new variable call it, calling it affected rows. We'll set it equal to result set one object oriented notation followed by affected underscore rows and if there are any rows that are affected they'll be returned momentarily let's copy this printf statement and just modify it to suit our needs and we'll simply call it total affected records and instead of record count we'll simply substitute record count with affected rows We'll save the changes, return to the shell, and rerun the query. Notice no records were affected because we were not performing an insert or an update type DML statement, which generally will yield affected rows. But it's good to know that the DBMS returned successfully zero to the PHP calling script. So two key useful methods include number of rows and affected rows. Whenever you write queries, you know you have to go through the four step process generally speaking however you do it is up to you whether you use includes or you move your code into different locations you basically have to construct your queries using the four steps which is to create the connection object 
followed by defining the query. These two steps are very easy and we've shown you how to test creating the connection object immediately after attempting to do so and performing logic or performing whatever tasks based on the results of the connection attempt. And once we have the, the query defined, we then attempt to execute the query, which we've nested into an if block. So in the event that it returns false, we can fail, followed by outputting the result set. But all while doing this, there are many methods that are available for our use, including the number of rows returned by the query, which can be very important, and the number of affected rows in the event that the query that you performed, the DML query that is, happens to be a typical insert or update type DML query which will yield a certain number of rows affected as well as a delete statement so we should note that affected rows note usually applies to insert update delete DML queries and we should also note for the return rows note usually applies to select queries but of course there are always going to be exceptions to the rules for example if you define stored procedures or stored functions that perform differently you may end up getting values for different types of functions or routines but generally speaking, those are the classes of DML statements that these two useful functions, affected rows and record count, apply to.